All right. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. Uh, normally, Bryant is on the call, but he had a, I think he has dinner with his mother-in-law this week. Um, so he he had to bow out. So I invited Brandon to join us. Uh, Brandon is uh, with Kiss Organics, but prior to working with Kiss, he ran a commercial hemp farm. He's been growing for, I think, 40 years now. Is that right? 39 years this year. So, yeah. 39 years. Awesome. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Brandon has experience growing with uh, salts, with organics. Um, now he's firmly in the living soil camp, and maybe he can touch on why. But um, yeah, he handles all the agronomy for KISS and uh, helps out on the consulting side and also put it together a pretty awesome dichotomous key to help growers kind of dial in on what's going on in their grow. So yeah, we're excited to have Brandon here. Yep. Gateway to Thanks. the Garden said, hell yeah, Brandon rocks. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank you. Uh, please, this is a Q&A, so post some questions, but while we're waiting for questions, I wanted to start off uh, just to hear from Brandon, like what genetics he's going to be running in his garden, what he's running right now, what he's most excited about. So awesome. let's start there. Yeah. yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, I'm running a bunch of stuff right now. The stuff I'm most excited about uh, from the last run was the oishi from archive the flavor on that one the terpene profile is just hands down my favorite right now so um i actually just finished up the last of my oishi from the last run so i'm going to do a lot more of it this round um i am also going to do some of the peanut butter cup donkey uh butter crosses uh we did a couple of those to honor uh some some friends that are no longer here with us and i know that jaya palmer was uh, a huge uh impact on both you and on uh kiss organics and just a really good friend of yours mine and justin's and so we're we're doing a cross to honor jaya and uh so that's that's going to be exciting to hunt that um i know that i i, I stole your pack of chef's cut your autos um so oh yeah I, i'll get these back to you before uh before too long um but i'm also um i'm also going to run some autos this year and uh, most folks know that up until a couple of years ago i really didn't like the autos and I, for different reasons mainly just i love having a photo period plant we can we can sit on it indefinitely we can clone it we can you know breed with it and so there's just all these advantages to me for regular um seeds but being in washington and doing one outdoor run last year where the plants just june july august were amazing and right about the time that flowers kicking in our dli out here just drops through the floor and so finishing was not optimal um i got great seed run but the flower wasn't anything i wanted to write home about or show off so i'm going to be running some autos this year um they 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 they're really wonderful in washington state they would be great in a place like South Carolina, where you've got to get plants out of the field before the hurricanes come, you know, but so um, hopefully we will be having Brian on, but Brian Sarabian from um, Crockett Family Farms, uh, those are the folks that did Tangy. Um, hopefully he'll be coming on to our Patreon book club uh, for one of our hangouts. Um, but so I am running several of the uh, Crockett Family Farms, I'm doing their auto guava, which is the guava pie times Watto dog. I'm doing their Stranano auto, their fuel truck, which is headband ghost times Watto dog, and then the Crockett's auto dog. So I'm going to be doing all those. I'm really excited to see how those perform. I know that Crockett Family Farms has a really good reputation for their autos. And then again, I'm super excited. Um, you know, uh, a friend with weed is a friend indeed. And so I'll definitely be stopping by to take some samples of this chef's cut. I talked to those guys at Soil Summit. So I'm excited to see how those turn out as well. Um, but yeah, those yeah, the there were are... there were the future cannabis project. They're yeah, they that yeah. part of that crew. And yes. uh, yeah, they gave me some seeds. So I'm going to run them 
outdoors at my house. And then you're getting me some cuts for uh, some Oishi uh, cuts mm -hmm. for my place. So I'm going to run all the same thing at my house. So I did Gorilla Glue number four last run because I have uh, a one employee that just that's all he likes. Right. I have to admit, it wasn't my favorite. It was I liked growing it, but the uh, effect of it was way headier than I expected it to be. Um, and uh, so that kind of surprised me. But um, yeah, anyway, we don't have to get too far into that. We've got some, we got some questions popping up. So oh, we great. Can start diving into the Q&A. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. So let's kick it off. We'll just go in order here. And, and I'm seeing some names I recognize, like Drew and, and Dwayne is on here. So that's fun awesome. to see. Um, Gateway to the Garden asks, would you ever consider bottom watering 45-gallon containers indoors in a tent in fabric pot? It saves on labor, and I've heard it helps the roots grow downwards. But are there cons? I I I'll jump in real quick, and then you can tell me what yeah. you think. Um, so I love to top water. Um, bottom watering is something that I'll do if I'm rehydrating some dry soil. You know, we've we've gone over that with some some growers, Tad, and I've done some visits with some folks who were watering but it was only getting so far down into the pot and so once they understood that if they had those sitting in in a tray any of that runoff is going to by capillary action get pulled back up into that pot so um, having water coming up from the bottom is a great way to help rehydrate old stuff um, it's a great way like if i'm going to go out of town and i don't have blue mats you know, that would be a, a way to make sure that you had some water for your weekend. Um, I don't think that it's optimal because it does, you know, we, we've talked about perched water tables and we can get into that if, if people want to talk about that. But what happens is you will have a essentially an anaerobic layer at the bottom. So you're really just making your pot smaller. So that 45 gallon pot becomes a 40 gallon pot. <clears throat> um, I also really like top watering because as the water pulls down through, it's also going to pull oxygen into the substrate, which is which is important. Um, I also really like top watering because we use gypsum, uh, potassium sulfate, Epsom salt, all these sulfates, and you want to get those wet so that they'll move down into the profile. They're very mobile in the soil. But if you're bottom watering, they're not going to get pulled down. Um, I also like top watering because obviously with this style of growing, we're not really doing any runoff. And so if you want that sodium, if you want that chloride to move down in your soil substrate, you've got to top water. Um, if you're bottom watering, it's basically just going to sit there or even worse, it could float up. So those are a bunch of reasons that I prefer um to top water over bottom watering okay i'll play uh i'll play devil's advocate here uh oops wrong question uh Dwayne says earth boxes work well if you haven't tried those yet i'd start there so if yes. you are new to growing um sips sub irrigated planters earth boxes bottom watering all similar things um simplify the watering process so if you're just not good at watering as a grower you're a new grower then this is a great entryway into this whole thing and i highly recommend it in that regard brandon brought up some good points my biggest thing is gas exchange i like get pushing oxygen down in by top watering but that being said you can absolutely grow really great plants um, using sub irrigated planters or using bottom watering uh so yeah, I would consider trying it out. One thing I will say is I have seen slightly lowered yields using uh, that methodology, and you would still need the top water when you first transplant the plant until the roots have a chance to get a little more established. But other than that, uh, yeah, I think you could absolutely give it a shot. Yeah, and Dwayne's, uh, Dwayne's sips always look really good, you know. No, yeah, that's a good point. So uh, just to stay kind of on topic, I'll go back up to the other questions, but this said, um, I'm bottom watering, chugging three gallon fabric pots, does dry faster, would it eat more nutrients as well? Um, I don't think that bottom watering would impact nutrient uptake in terms of requiring more nutrients. Um, 
yeah, I, yeah, I, don't I, I just so don't either. see a way that would would impact it. Yeah, that's more about transpiration, par levels, that that kind of stuff is really going to drive that uptake. Yeah, VPD. All right, we're just going to jump around today. So, uh, one other use for autos. This is a good point. You can do a quick spring run, and then not have to worry about. And then the second run could be um, photo period ones. If you can get, if you have the ability to have a photo period finish, it gives you two runs through that nice period when you have good sunlight in the summer. So that is a great option for folks. Yeah. So I just wanted to throw that great comment, Gateway. Good point. Yeah, your dad and I were actually talking about that this morning early about what I was going to do, and I'm going to put autos out. But then I'm going to do a light depth run as well. And so if I wanted, I could do the autos in there and then do that light depth run afterwards. But Yeah. Totally changing topics again. Uh, do you think it will get to a point where there will be no new flavors? If so, when? Like, are we, are we, I guess, so... Another way of saying this is, are we losing genetic diversity in cannabis? Um, what do you think? Oh, I, I think we're definitely losing genetic um, potential in cannabis um, where we get these new, uh, you know, I, I think everybody on here is pretty savvy, pretty, um, pretty tuned in that we are kind of bottleneck in terms of genetics, if you look at a lot of the cannabinoid maps, they look fairly identical. Um, we, we're selecting for a single note THC experience. We're selecting for bag appeal as opposed to these more complex uh, cannabinoid op, you know, options. This was a little higher, this is a little lower, gives you a different effect. Um, <clears throat> I think what really scares me as an older grower is the land race uh, genetics that those you know basically genetics waiting to be explored have really for the most part in just about even the most remote areas some well-meaning person went to amsterdam got some afghan crosses and went to asia South America, the Caribbean, went to all these places and said, hey, look, I can help you. You know, here's here's a uniform monocrop. And that that kind of damaged those genetic pools. They're not pure anymore. And so we've kind of watered those down. Um, with that said, you know, like if you if you if you go plant an apple from an apple that you ate, um, the only thing that you can guarantee about the apple that will grow from that is that it will not be the apple you ate. And so there's all, you know, all the apples we eat are from clones. And so there's, you know, cannabis does have a huge genetic population. And so there, I don't think we're going to run out of new flavors or, or even experiences. I think some of the stuff that Chris uh, was talking about from floor and flame at soil summit, uh, some of those things are really important. We just need to, we need to get people as far as our breeding projects. Um, I'm a pollen chucker. I'm more than happy to, you know, try to try to take two cultivars I like and put them together. But I think that when people start doing gene editing, start using a CRISPR, when people can start doing some of these things, um, then I think that we'll have you know, uh, the ability to kind of steer both the experience and the terpenes. You know that I love begonias. And one of the reasons I got into begonias was because the begonia folks have mapped a lot of these terpenes. And so they have a, a begonia that really smells like a, you know, I've never had a peanut butter breath that tasted like peanut butter. I've never seen one. Um, you can get a begonia that smells like a jar of Jif peanut, peanut butter, though. And so, sure. you know, so I don't think we're going to run out. I think that we're bottlenecked right now. And I do think that when I go into a dispo, 99% of it looks and feels the same to me. Um, but I don't think we're going to run out. I just think this plant has so much potential. We just have to have, you know, people who are dedicated to that, you know, like you and I are kind of dedicated to, 
you know, NPK and compost and things like that. There's people out there that all they care about is breeding. And I think those folks will continue to tease out new flavors and things. See, I would, I would argue the opposite. I mean, yes, we have seen some stuff disappear probably, but we also have more people cultivating and breeding. I think I, I'm, I, I assume right now more so than ever before in human history. And so, well, I think there's two things we need to, we need to differentiate between genotype and phenotype. So when we're talking about genotype, that's the genetic potential of the plant. And then the phenotype is that actual expression of the, the genotype itself. So um, I think as, as we get additional um, phenotypes coming out, we'll, we'll find stuff that people really like. And then I think that stuff will become really popular. And, and that's what creates these, you know, hype strains that we see out there. But um, there's, there's going to be mutation happening with this many, uh, this much cultivation going on and this much breeding going on. And so I think we're actually going to see some new stuff come out that might be really special if people, if people stick with it. It's just a matter of us, the science getting there to where we can really understand it and um, know that what we have is something that's worth keeping. So that's kind of my thoughts on it. But no, um, I, I think that's 100%. We just need the science brought to our breeding but the magic of an F1, I know people that, you know, don't like F1s, but for me, that's just like that present under the Christmas tree. You have no idea what it's going to be. And, you know, a lot of times it's mids, but sometimes you get that strain that's that cultivar that's just, you know, your absolute favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm just I'm catching up on the comments here too. Uh, anyway, I I wanted to uh, change topics, and we'll see if this is a topic of interest. But I just uh, I just finished an interview with <clears throat> To Me Genomics, talking about pathogens, uh, specifically hop latent viroid, and I haven't had a chance to share any of that with you, uh, Brandon. So I thought maybe we could talk about that right now if people are interested. Um, otherwise, uh, another topic was I just re-amended my soil beds and I thought that might be another thing to talk about because there were some comments on Instagram around it that I thought were interesting. So I don't know. Do you have a preference? Does anyone in the audience have a preference? Hop latent viroid, re-amending soil, something else altogether? Yeah, I'll, I'll leave that to the gallery to decide. You All right. Well, while... I think I think we're a little bit ahead of the actual um, comments, so like we're a little ahead of the live, so it might take a second. Um, so in the meantime, I, I'll just I'll just share some of the highlights on the hop latent viroid side. So one of the things that was really interesting that I learned today was that they can actually test seeds. So a breeder could send in seeds to get tested and then know that that batch of seeds, you know, you send in five seeds for testing. Those all come back clean. You can be pretty confident in saying that, um, your, your seed run is clean. Uh, so you can test the mother, you can test the seeds. Um, I asked her about the question from, uh, Steve Cantwell, this idea that if we, if we cycle our plants rapidly and don't allow viroid load to build up, could we get it to an undetectable level to where it's not as big of an issue? And she thought, she said, yes, that is possible. She's also seen it backfire, but she did believe that that is something we can do. So if we could, um, because Steve brought up a great point. Like if we keep talking about hop latent viroid, like it's this end all be all thing in cannabis, um, at some point regulators are going to catch on and then they're going to require us to test everything which is going to raise costs dramatically and shut people down and just, it just create a huge bureaucratic mess. Um, so I appreciated that perspective. So for him, he's like, it's not a big deal. It's let's not worry about it. Let's not get scared of it. Let's um, let's just manage it. And for him, he thinks if you have a healthy plant, you can just keep reducing vi viroid load and, and not have this problem. So. Yeah. I think that management is something that, you know, none of us want top latent, but a lot of people have it. And I think that Steve was dead on, you know, uh, you and I've had this conversation about when and if we get 
you know, federal decriminalization on cannabis and Robert Thomas that you interviewed on your podcast with, uh, um, he was the, uh, the testing specialist. This was his thought as well. As soon as it goes federally uh, regulated, the testing is going to go through the roof. Um, one, the people who make money off of testing want to, um, see more testing because they're going to make more money off yeah. of it. They're yeah. the ones advising the government as to whether we should test or not. He's like, so that's going to play out exactly how you think that's going to play out. And then because it's a new crop, every scientist that I know that's in ag is kind of curious about it. You know, just the fact that they can get published every week makes it attractive to a lot of researchers. Um, so I just think we'll see a huge uptick in heavy metals, aspergillus just everything across the board so you know like in washington state where we are pretty you know we don't really have to worry about heavy metals for you know production cannabis when i talk to people i still tell them you know be ready you don't want to have to dump all of your soil when it goes federally legal and then you start over because you've been adding fertiles instead of calfos or you've been doing you know so I think that people, whether they're in a state that's being tested or not, should probably be gearing up for those protocols just to protect themselves. Yeah, we want to be growing the healthiest medicine, oh, healthiest plants yeah. we can. Um, yeah, this is a good question by Roger. Uh, if you plug an infected plant into a living soil, but is your bed nuked? We've We've seen this happen commercially with people who have uh, living soil beds. Uh, and they keep going. Uh, we, th we haven't had to toss the soil for it. Um, it is something challenging. So that's where managing viral viroid load comes into play. And the same would be the case with Pythium, Fusarium, things like that. Um, though with Fusarium, I'd probably m be more, uh, I I'd be faster to remove the soil than I would for some of these other things, but there are, there are some things we can do to remediate the soil with, um, with hop latent viroid, it's all about viro viroid load. So what we would typically would do, or what, what we did with, with the facility that had this problem was we made sure that all the plants going in were, were as healthy as possible. And then we made sure not to stress the plant, um, during the growth cycle. So avoid like wet dry cycles, avoid any weird, you know, issues in terms of how we were caring for, you know, there were no flooding, things like that. Um, and then the last, it makes sure the fertility was on point, CO2, all of that. And then uh, when we pulled the plant, we pulled as much of the root material as we could. And just doing that cycle after cycle uh, really helps. So this idea that what Steve was talking about, of just trying to think about it as from viroid load and keep reducing that. And if the plant goes in clean, you, the thing that I, and I don't have the research on this yet, but my assumption is that the, it's not picking up and moving enough viroid into the sap during that, what, 55 to 60 days that we're getting a huge expression that's going to affect yield dramatically. If you start with a young plant in veg that has hop latent viroid and then you take it all the way through and that viroid loss has time to build up, then I would expect to see more likely see an issue with that expression of the viroid that would reduce yields and cause some of the other symptoms that we associate with it. But um, yeah, it's really all about, it's really all about management from a viroid load perspective. And then genetics plays a huge role. Some genetics can just handle high levels of hop latent viroid. Some can't. Uh, so that was, that was basically some of the stuff that we talked about today. Um, and keep, keep an eye time. on your, your pest pressures because that's another way that you could get you know hop latent is like hiv you're not going to get it from hugging somebody you know um those plants have to you know you could have two plants in separate pots their leaves could touch i i i don't think you're going to get hop latent but if you've got an aphid on the infected plant and now it's chewing on your healthy plant then yes you could get hop latent transmission that way they're doing research on that right now actually but they are leading towards the idea that it, it can be transmitted that the yeah. pests could insects could potentially vector it but that that research is ongoing from according to uh tassie i'll say her name correctly so yeah all right enough about 
enough about virus viroids and viruses. Uh, let's let's get back to soil stuff. <laughs> so uh, this question from Gateway was uh, black leaf mold, how it differs from peat moss, pros, cons, and things to know. So I'll share what I know, unless Brandon, you want to go first. You're welcome to jump on this one. I don't care. Yeah, I mean, this is probably a better question for you because I tend to double down on the MPK and you're always reminding me the the physical aspects. But when when I've made my own leaf mold, uh, which you can do pretty quickly in South Carolina and it takes a long time in Washington, um, I would look at that as a as more of a compost input versus a, you know, because peat and peat's non-nutrient, you know, um, it's it's going to hold water for you. And that's, that's what I think of for Pete. Um, leaf mold is going to bring in NPK. You definitely would have to add a lot of aggregate for leaf mold, but I don't know. I'd let you take that one, Tab. Yeah. So I got introduced to it because my father would collect leaves every year from all the neighbors in big piles. He, he still scavenges leaves like, uh, like an addict. And I've got a truck uh, typically, load of them, uh, sitting out here right now. Yeah, a lot of maple, alder, uh, a lot of deciduous these deciduous trees in the Washington area, and he takes them all and dumps them in giant piles, and then lets it break down over time. Um, he would add alf organic alfalfa meal, sprinkle that in there, and then give it six eight months. And what what would happen in the garden? in the vegetable garden and also where he had some cannabis plants was um, over the winter that would provide a nice mulch that would keep weeds from, from getting weed seeds from getting a, a foothold and then also just break down and add additional organic matter to the garden. So it's a great way to manage the garden. And that's how I manage my raised beds in my garden is I'll just cover them with leaves. And at the end of the, you know, start of the next season, I'll just pull those leaves back off. Um, and start over and some of those leaves will have broken down now fully composted you know black leaf mold compost where the, you let the leaves completely compost and you, what you end up with is this very like friable black beautiful compost um it tends to be fairly low in nutrients i i haven't seen anyone in cannabis growing just purely in leaf mold because that would take a lot of leaves to get there but using it uh as a mulch layer, I think is a really, really good way to use it. And then using it as a portion of your compost fraction, knowing that that's going to give you that, some of that carbon source, um, the C that you need there, or the browns, as, as you hear it called sometimes, green to browns or carbon to nitrogen. That's a great source for that. So like what my dad was doing was taking the, the, the leaf mold, which is browns, carbon, and then adding organic alfalfa meal or grass clippings you could use too is that that end source that green and then balancing that to get the compost to heat up kill off the weeds that were in there um, the weed seeds any pathogens and then he would let it static compost for at least a year and that was really the key to it was letting it sit for a really long time there's no shortcuts to that process but if you let it sit long enough that stuff um, is phenomenal yeah if it's if it's fully finished it's like when you go into old growth forest and you scrape back some leaves and you smell that incredible sweet black rich soil that's essentially what you're making um and i think tad already touched on it but just to clarify when tad's dad's adding that alfalfa that's really just to um get the the microbes happy we're not doing that to add nitrate for the finished product right uh, no, I never looked at it like that. So that was that was how we used to make our compost tea fungal compost that we would sell. Okay. Was okay. It was a, a whole bunch of leaves from scavenged from our property and then giant piles, added alfalfa, allowed it to heat up, go through that thermophilic process and, and process that and then let it break down slowly. And then we'd pull from there, we'd pull a really microbially active awesome compost that we'd add a little more alfalfa to to spike the microorganisms again um i just threw this comment up here because i didn't i didn't know who talked about leaf mold compost um 
I can't imagine substituting it fully for the peat moss. Yeah. It just it doesn't have good. the same physical properties, but I haven't tried it. So someone wants to yeah. try it before back. I think that that would be bad in terms of the final tilth and physical properties of your soil. And then um, something else that your dad was talking about, one of the reasons he likes to do those leaf piles is, you know, we're in Washington state and he's growing bananas. And so he uses that leaf mold to keep those bananas, you know, because there's some microbial activity, they stay warm. And even though we did have one hard freeze, they're they're coming back no problem and it's because of that heat from the pile protecting them so another point on that but i would not use it as a substitute for peat do you want to answer this one brandon um bring in a few hundred starts to be planted in 7.5 ph compost for the season water only can i add sulfur at transplant um so at a pH of 7.5, I would feel really good about, um, I'd want to know first, are these in pots? Are they in beds? Like, you know, what, what type of soil? But, you know, pH 7.5, 1.5 cups of elemental sulfur would bring that down, uh, but that's per yard. So you would have to do the math on that. I would want to mix that really thoroughly with the, the entire substrate before I planted into it. Um, the, the reason being is, you know, I'll see people top dress with sulfur, hoping it'll bring their pH down. And it does, brings it down to like three at the surface. And so any, any pH management input, I think should be completely thoroughly homogeneously mixed throughout the entire substrate profile. So obviously you can't do that once you have plants in. Um, and then, you know, young starters could be kind of sensitive, uh, especially if you're top dressing with sulfur. So I think you'd wipe out a good number of your plants if you did that. So I would mix the sulfur homogeneously first, then, then plant into it. And then, you know, if you can pH your water down to seven, you know, depends on alkalinity, but that should be fine. I have a ton of questions, Drew. Um, I, I would want to know, like, are you growing in straight compost? Are you mixing that compost into with your native soil? Do you have a soil test? Do you have any other metric besides pH that we can go off of? What's creating that pH too also plays a role. Is it sodium? Is it calcium? Uh, what cations are they? And what's the balance there? Uh, also with compost, you want to make sure you want to do a germination test before you plant your, you know, you get too far into it, make sure there's no herbicides or other things that are residual in your compost. If you, if you're getting commercial compost, um, it can vary quite a bit. So, uh, yeah, there's just, it's a, it's a complicated question in terms of getting the pH down. Sulfur is a good option, but it takes time, which you don't really have. So, um, yeah, I would probably cut it with some peat and try and uh, manage it through my liquid fertigation, you know, using things that are going to drop your pH too, maybe some uh, fish hydrolysate, things like that to get your pH down a little bit. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would try and incorporate that into another media like soil or something rather than just growing in straight compost. So yeah, I would saying, never grow in straight compost. It just doesn't have the physical attributes I want. And then, um, yeah, I, I think peat's a great suggestion because it's acidic and it's going to bring your pH down some anyway. Then you there, get, there actually was a, there was I, I got into this pretty deep because there was a Canadian farmer that was dealing with an issue kind of like this. Their soil was really high and they needed to lower the pH right away. Um, the one study I found on it showed that the adding peat moss did not lower the ph significantly um i'll have to go back and and read into that and that's what led me down the road to sulfur and things like that so uh, i i don't know um that's Com a tough compost one. compost is such a tough topic because even with commercial compost as you and i've seen over and over and over again from all the tests we look at it's really really hard to get um inputs that are consistent and so obviously inconsistent inputs inconsistent output 
And then, you know, I, the number of tests I've seen of folks who are doing their own local compost, they're almost always off the charts with one or both bad actors, sodium or chlorides. Um, a lot of them have heavy metals. And so, you know, compost, you know, if you're crafting your own soil, that's that's going to be the really hard thing, you know, out of that tripod. Um, yeah, compost. Yeah, there's so many questions about compost before you would even add it. Um, so, yeah, just to jump in on that, I think uh, just to back up, whenever you think about soil or if you're thinking or media or using your compost as your soil or media, um, just keep in mind that there's really three things you want to look at. The physical aspects of that, because compost can be very well strained and very fine and you could add water to it and it could turn into a mucky mess or it could have a lot of large particulate in it that actually allows for a good, you know, porosity and gas exchange and all of that. So there's the physical properties, those are the biological properties, which I wouldn't worry about too much with the compost. You're, you're probably going to have that there. It's the nature of compost. And then the chemical properties, like make sure it's not super high in sodium or uh, chlorides or that it has sufficient calcium or not too much potassium. Uh, all of those things are really nice to know. If you don't know them, at the end of the day, just plant some plants, see how they do. If they seem happy, you can kind of manage from there. If I could only have one metric on a compost test, I would want to know the carbon to nitrogen ratio. And then if I could get two, I'd want to know the pH. So if I, you know, I feel like I can do more work with that, but making sure that carbon to nitrogen ratio is under 18 to one, I think that's the most important thing as far as selecting a compost. Because it just won't, just won't release any nitrates. Cool. All right. So what is the release rate for calcium silicate, uh, AKA will last tonight. Um, I can touch on this. Did you have anything you wanted to say regarding it? Do you want me to tackle it? You can tackle it, but it's just a slower, it's going to be slow to break down. Um, silicate, silicate versus sulfate. You can always think that the sulfates break down quickly. The silicates break down slowly. That's the rule I've always followed. If, tell me if I'm wrong. Well, yeah. Well, potassium silicate's pretty available. Yeah, true, true. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so. What I was going to say though is the the things to think about with release rates in soil is uh, one, it's complicated. It's not standardized across the board. Um, I don't think of it as like you, I, I always heard like blood meal is, is a fast release nitrogen and feather meal is slow release nitrogen. Um, and, and things get categorized that way. So like, do you want your nitrogen right away all up front or do you want it over a period of weeks kind of thing? I think a better way to look at it is um, in relationship to particle size. So like, are we putting in uh, um, like a very fine powder? Like uh, I think of like the egg lime that we carry, for example, is a, it's a super fine powder. Think like cocaine or baking soda uh, sort of thing. Or um, I know, says the guy who's never tried cocaine. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I'm yeah. talking about when I describe it. Um, so kind of like that. Or um, are we talking about something that's like uh, prilled or pelletized, which has much less surface area? And so that's going to take a lot longer for the microbes to break that down. So the, the main things in terms of availability are going to be um, particle size, soil temperature because that's going to relate to the microbes ability to reproduce rapidly are you I mean are you reproducing at rapidly at 40 degrees probably not at 80 degrees yeah you are so it's the same with microbes it's, it's the exact same idea so uh i think about temperature and then i also think about um hydrology so moisture level so getting getting optimal conditions for the microbes to break that stuff down is really um, and, and make and also solubilize the uh, material is really what's going to affect your release rate. So um, it is going to be available during the cycle. Uh, things like diatomaceous earth, calcium silicate are great SI sources of things that can be added in uh, to when you go to reamend. Otherwise, uh, things like uh, potassium silicate, the egg cell 16H is another way to get good available SI uh, as you're going along. 
Uh, let's see here. What is this? I'm catching up on comments here, guys. But silicate versus carbonate is well, last night versus lime. Sulfate is gypsum, which doesn't affect pH and only soluble. Yes. Yes, that's all true. So well, last night, calcium silicate. Lime, uh, like agricultural lime, calcium carbonate. Um, dolomite lime or dolomitic lime, calcium magnesium carbonate. Gypsum, calcium sulfate. Um, you're right. Well, last night will raise pH, but not as rapidly as agricultural lime or oyster shell flour, which is really the same thing as ag lime. Gypsum doesn't affect your pH um, true to, to a most to the certain extent. Yeah, it's not. It's going to buffer your pH for the most part. Um, but and the solubility of it, like you mentioned, is uh, is not terribly high, which means that it's not going to cause a lot of uh, cause a lot of issues with um toxicities i guess if that makes sense sorry people are commenting on my uh my cocaine comment oh, your cocaine comment i was kind of shocked too i was like oh wow okay it's, when you think about like a, a a really fine powder that's i don't know like diatomaceous earth <laughs> yeah so would yes, my reference. Yeah, um, you could use much. you could use DE. There are there's some research. Um, if you're really interested in silica, go back and listen to my podcast with Dr. Wendy Zellner. Um, it is silicon, not silicone. Um, just to just to keep in mind that they are different. So what we're looking at is SI silicon, um, but I say I'm wrong all the time. So not giving you a hard time. Um, but yeah, she did a whole study using diatomaceous earth and found it was fairly available um, for the plant. Uh, oh man, there's a lot of good questions here. Well, I'm going to go back up because I, I know we missed some and then I saw a good one down there about Kootzman. So I want to pull up. Okay. All right. Any thoughts on this, Brandon? Cottonseed is going to be very hard to find um, that's not GMO and not with a lot of pesticides. So that would be my concern. If you can find, you know, when I was growing up, cottonseed meal was kind of like the, the you know, kind of like where I'm like with gypsum. It was just, sure, throw some on. Um, but finding a, a, a good quality source is going to be the biggest issue, I think. Um. Yeah, if we're talking about organic cottonseed meal, then by definition, by being certified organic, it will be GMO free. Uh, there was a paper that I recently um, referenced for a talk that I did. I'm going to put do the whole talk again and put it up on YouTube here. Uh, but essentially what they found in the study was that blood meal, bone meal, uh, they didn't look at cottonseed, um, but they did look at a few plant-based inputs like cocoa shells and a few other things. And they found that uh, there was no uh, GMOs in the final product, which was interesting. Um, there was also really no pathogens. Um, the only pesticides were on some of the plant-based products. And uh, overall, they were really clean. Um, in terms of the blood meal, uh, yes, you would get some iron from the blood meal. It's, it's not the funnest stuff to work with, but if it's uh, closing uh, it's closing a loop in our food supply system, even if you don't like that loop or that, this, you know, if you don't want to support the meat industry, I totally get that. I don't really want to either, but I, I have to acknowledge that it exists and it, it's the main way that the main way that we get our food in this country. So if I can use a waste product from that rather than it going into a landfill or something that's really the highest use for it. So if it is clean, then I do want to use it. So um, yeah, that works it's great. A, it's a great nitrate source. It's a great iron source. The thing with iron is that we use, we target these higher pHs and at higher pHs, you have a hard time with iron uptake. And so that's where you want to think about a, you know, a chelator, um, get some fulvic, get some humic acid into your soil. Um, that's going to help you with iron uptake you may have plenty in the soil but when you see that little pale um lime green at, at, you know at the top of your plant and it's starting you know at the at the inside at the 
you know, and then going out to the tip of the plant where the tip is darker and the middle is lighter. That's, that's iron every time I see it in every single grow I've ever been in. Um, it always grows out of it, but if you are concerned about an iron issue, a chelator or, or pH adjustment might be, you know, drop down to six, five. So one thing Bryant talks about is iron oxidizes so rapidly in your soil. Uh, we actually talked about this on a live, I think it was a couple back now, uh, but his suggestion was he wants to experiment with putting a, uh, like a spike like a tube of iron down in by the roots of the plant and then putting sulfur in with that iron to keep the pH really low, to keep the iron from oxidizing. And then the roots can make their way over to that spot to access what they need in terms of iron. Cause then just created this little like low pH pocket in your soil there. Uh, the only issue with that is when you go to reamend, you'd have to be aware of that and kind of be careful. And when you go to soil test, also be aware of that and not pull your sample from there because that would mess up your tests. But um, I haven't figured out a way to trial that without really like impacting my beds to where I might have to take them out or make massive adjustments. But I, I think that would be a fun experiment to run maybe in a larger container or something to see. Um, but I don't tend to see, like you said, the iron doesn't seem to be, I haven't done enough tissue testing. In, in it's, it's not the really limiting no. factor. For me, that's so that's a good way to put it. That's that. So I don't worry about it. I just really don't worry about it. I get pictures all the time. People are terrified, and I'm like, it'll be totally fine. I, I would ignore that one. Cool. And then you talked about neem cake. Uh, the the problems with the pesticides with neem. I think that if you want to touch on that, the, that was great information for growers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually. So I just did an episode with Mr. Grow it today, and then we talked about neem cake. Um, nothing wrong with neem cake in the sense it's got fertility. I know Coots really, uh, he's the reason I added it to my soils originally. He really likes neem. Um, I, part of that goes back to his own spirituality around, uh, uh, being a Taoist, I think. And I think he's a Taoist. Um, but he's, he's very attracted to the, to, to the tree itself as sort of a sacred tree. Um, the issues with it are that it's grown in India. So right, right away there, we have a huge fossil fuel cost just to get it to us here in the United States. Uh, in addition, we did have a farm in Oregon fail for uh, pesticide chemistry that hasn't been allowed in the United States since the 70s. And essentially what had happened there was um, the, they try, they traced it back to the neem oil, not the neem cake, but the neem oil. So the neem cake is the seed from the neem tree pressed. And depending on how many times and how well they press that determines how much oil is left in there. And that, um, that cake can vary on as directing content based on how well that the oil has been pressed out of it. Um, I don't know, but but I don't know how much of the um, pesticides were in the neem cake itself, but in the neem oil, they actually traced the issue with the Oregon farm back to the neem oil, and uh, that's where it had been sprayed on the neem tree. They'd harvested the neem tree and made it in there, and then enough trace amounts ended up in uh, the neem oil that got sprayed on the cannabis plants in Oregon, and then they failed for it. So it's just something to be aware of. I. I think that's a risk with any um, anything coming internationally. So, yeah, that's that being said, you can absolutely use a little bit of neem cake. It's probably fine. One cool usage for neem cake that, again, I'll, I'll give credit to Coot for this, was I had a nasty fungus gnat problem when I first started growing in a new uh, a new room once, and I. It was, it was far away at the time. And so I wasn't checking it regularly and it got out of control. It, I mean, they were, they were stuck to the lights. They were everywhere. They were, the cards were just black with, with fungus gnats. And so what Coot said I should do was I took two cups of neem cake in a five gallon bucket. I bubbled it because I had compost tea brewers everywhere. That was what we did uh, for 24 hours just, just to solubilize it. And then I watered the surfaces of all my soil with it. So I gave it a full good watering and that knocked back the, the um, 
fungus gnats incredibly well. I was shocked with how well it worked. Now we have other options now, like, you know, BTI, Bacillus thuringiensis is, is really um, uh, You could use diatomaceous earth, I guess, too. Uh, SF, SF nematodes is really the best way to deal with it. They're just a little bit expensive, but man, so worth it. So yeah, the, but that's a good little neem cake trick that you could always try if, if you were on a budget and you had some laying around and you had some fungus gnats. It's worth a shot. So. And for the pest deterrence note there, I really like frass or anything that's got chitinase in it as far as something that sends out a um, detectable warning to insects as a deterrent. As a direct and will kill insects, but I don't know, and it's just my ignorance, I don't know if it's a deterrent or not chemically. I thought, I, I heard it was a neural disruptor for insects. I. I know that you have to be very careful with it around marine life. Um, yeah. And then also. Uh, I wonder if it would kill uh, roly polies then because they're a mollusk and that's one of the problems with isopods. You know, people can't get rid of them. I wonder if. Um, as a I don't believe so. Okay. I don't believe so. I, I, I know people have tried that. Yeah. One thing that is interesting that Suzanne shared was some research that neem oil when applied will keep beneficials from coming back to the leaf surface longer than okay. something like stuff oil. So you apply your stuff oil, you can come back in 24 hours later with your beneficials or even hours later, really. Whereas with neem oil, they, you may come back in with them and then they may just like wander off again. Cause they don't like, uh, I'm going to guess the, probably the the smell of the neem or there's something in there some chemical component that makes them not want to be there so yeah uh bob i wanted to comment on this because i've this has happened to me too uh the best thing i found to do when i when you get your egg still is is take it put a little take a gallon jug like an old milk jug put a little bit of water in the bottom you know it's filled up like a quarter of the way wear a mask you won't get silicosis from this interestingly enough even though it is potassium silicate, because uh, I did ask Dr. Zelder about that. But you, but wear a mask, wear gloves, pour it in there. It's going to actually heat up a little bit. It's an exothermic reaction, which is crazy. Um, and then fill the rest of it with water. And then that becomes your concentrate. And then you just take it every time you want to use it, shake it, what, half teaspoon, teaspoon per gallon, I think is the, is the rate on yeah. that. Um, and it just makes it really easy. So yeah, otherwise you're, it's going to turn into a rock. Yeah. And my, mine did the same thing, you know, the first time I got ag cell and I just, I, I had this brass hammer that I just beat it up with and it pulverized it and mm. that's it. Yeah. All right. Stadwind asked this question twice. And uh, so I felt like that's I had Casper. It hey, Casper, Casper from Germany. We met at soil. Center. Oh, Casper. Hey. Hey, buddy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Good to see yeah. you on here. Straight from um, Soil Summit to, to Spanibus. Uh, so hopefully he's back home safe and sound now. I have some thoughts. Do you do you want to comment on this or do you want me to take it? Go for it. I've got some thoughts too, but yeah, go for it. You can go first. Go ahead. I've been okay, talking yeah. too much. Well, I, I feel like you'll probably have more to add to this. Um, the Kook Mix, uh, there's a couple things that I would change. One, um, I... I lean on compost um, and it might be because I'm an NPK guy, but I lean on compost most heavily for biology. And so I tend to use, if I'm gonna make my own mix, I tend to use less compost than a lot of folks do. I think that having a little bit of good quality compost is, is all I need. So I'm, I'm focused on um, the, the mineral nutrients. One of the issues that I see with testing Coots mix is the variability in compost from person to person. And Coot spends so much time feeding his worms so that their their exudates, their poop, their you know, the vermicompost is gonna bring in a good bit of the the fertility for a mix uh, for him 
personally, what I see when it's somebody in Germany or somebody in South Carolina or wherever, if they don't have that same compost, they end up falling really short on their fertility. Um, so I think those are my two main things with it. Ted, what do you? Yeah, so I so you said the biology, and then I the, like less uh, compost. I think he puts too much compost for just the physical aspects. I don't like that. I don't like that one third, one third, one third uh, approach to things, and I I feel like that's it's just too much. Like you were talking about, you know, if you've got a lot of fines. Uh, and we just saw it with Justin, you know, uh, and, and um, it, an, another grower, when they were trying to flush big, long beds, all those fines just kept blocking everything up for them. Um, it, you know, it's definitely detrimental to your gas exchange and your soil. Um, so that and, yeah. and the fertility, those are my two primary issues with it. Okay. Um, yeah. So I definitely like to use less compost. Um for a few reasons uh one the physical property i like the the properties of peat a little bit better so i typically would go like 50 percent peat 33 percent uh pumice or perlite and then 17 percent compost so uh what does that equal that's pretty close to 100 i think i nailed yep. it yeah um yeah, and then if I was going to add biochar, I would pull that out of the peat fraction. And that's pretty much our base mix for most of our formulations. Um, the reason the reason we do that is because there's some good research that just shows, um, I read a paper a long time ago, it said about 15 percent uh was sort of the 15 to 20 percent sort of the optimal level of worm castings in a mix that they did in a in a study. Um I, I don't see a lot of benefit to we already have high organic matter. We already have um, plenty of nutrient cycling and biology just at, at 15%. Um, the soil, the soil yeah. gets so sticky at, at above 20%. It's just mucky. Uh, it can be if your compost is really well, uh, well strained, then that could be an issue. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, you know, Coots recipe was what? Neem crab kelp rock dust. Um, this was all done before we really knew much about heavy metals. Uh, honestly, um, I think that's the biggest issue I have with it beyond the fertility imbalances. Uh, because with the, with the rock dust, you're getting, you're getting heavy metals with the kelp. You're getting a lot of arsenic, um, with the neem, I, the neem's actually pretty clean in terms of heavy metals, but you have that huge fossil fuel impact. Uh, crab actually is going to bring in some heavy metals too. So we've cut back on those things in our mixes primarily for the reason of heavy metals. Um, and I think that the balance of nutrients, like, like Brandon talked about, you know, could always, someone else already said in here, like you're never growing in Coots mix cause you don't have Coots, you don't have Coots compost. And, and that just brings up a better point is like, you should always formulate your soil around your compost source. You know, we've had to go through it here recently with KISS with trying to source new commercial composts. And that's your starting point because every compost is going to be different. So and that's Bryant's line yeah. as well. You know, you build around your compost and because that's the variability, you have to do it that way. Yeah. So I don't think this is so much about sing like uh, singling out Coots recipe as it is any online recipe. Uh, potentially could have this issue so and again uh, just something it works to keep in mind. it works really well for coot because he does all this you know work for his compost his vermicompost um so could it work for somebody else it most certainly could uh on average i think people will run into issues just because of the the variability on compost yeah i think it's a good starting point for folks on a recipe if you just don't know where to start um, something like that could work. Um, I personally like our nutrient pack better, but obviously I'm biased towards that. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people have grown in Coots mix and gotten really great results. So I don't want to say that it's not possible. It's just, these are the things to consider if you want to look at it from a sort of a soil science perspective or from a soil testing perspective. And I think you can definitely, we can demonstrate just 
and it doesn't have to be the KISS nutrient pack, but a complete organic fertilizer that's hitting our target metrics, which are higher than what's in the coop mix, you get better yields, you know, with, with that added fertility. So we, you know, we've been able to see that over and over again. Yeah, the last thing to touch on would be the bulk density of the soil with compost. It's gonna it's gonna increase faster than something that's a little more of a, a stable uh, substrate like peat. So, yeah, I don't know that I have a lot more to add to that, but that was a good question. Yeah. Um. Cool. Well, I know we have a few more questions. We've already been talking for an hour, though. Um, anything you wanted to say before we sign off and, and maybe we can get you back on here another time. Oh, no, it's fun. Uh, anytime, um, what we've got, uh, a hangout coming tomorrow. Uh, we've got a book club coming up for teaming with microbes. And, uh, I know some folks have asked, um, your dad, Leon Hussey is going to drop in for the compost section and <laughs> yeah. uh, I think he's excited I think other people are excited and uh, so that'll be a lot of fun um, like I said we're going to try to get Brian on here soon um, so we've got some cool stuff going on there but that's yeah no thanks for having me man I appreciate it yeah this has been a lot of fun we've been, I've been trying to do one every week with Chad Westport kind of more of a home grow perspective and then this one the Bryant that tends to be a little more uh more advanced, a little more uh, soil science-y kind of thing. But uh, I'm gonna try and keep these going. I love seeing all the people in the chat. Like I, I can put a face to most of these names now, which is which is a lot of fun. So I appreciate you guys for tuning in. And uh, upcoming, like Bryant had something this week. I know Chad's going to the Netherlands. I have a, a trip to Melbourne coming up um, in April or May. Uh, so there's a lot of just stuff that's going to be happening. So um, we may have to switch to like every other week. So that might be like one a week, might work out to one a week or um, something, but I do want to keep this going. So it's been a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. So I just want to let people know we're, we're going to figure out a way to keep doing lives because I think it's, it's been great. And uh, yeah, reach out, reach out if we can help you over at KISS. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for coming. It wouldn't be any fun if nobody showed up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care, guys.